Welcome to the Global Business Women's Pod, brought to you by the Greater Houston Women's Chamber of Commerce. I am Susan Dyson and proud to be the CEO, President, and Founder of the Chamber. Please join us for this empowering podcast every Thursday at 6 p.m. What a great looking crowd. Hello everyone, my name is Jackie Bally. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. I have the phenomenal opportunity to interview your next speaker, the wonderful, wonderful Jean Celestine Lakin. She is the author of A Voice in the Darkness, memoir of a Rwandan genocide survivor. And as you can tell, I have my own copy. If you don't have your copy, I highly, highly recommend you go get it. Before we uh, have our questions, I would like to briefly read her bio from her memoir. It is quite extensive. Excuse the glasses, when you get to a certain age, you have to have readers. And if I have to have readers, they may as well look cute, right? <laughs> Jean Celestine Lakin was orphaned by the genocide against, how do you say, Tusi? Tusi, which claimed most of her family members. Nearly four years later, at age 14, she immigrated to the United States and learned English. English is not her first language, but she's very eloquent in English. Later, she earned her master's degree, worked as an adoption counselor, and now serves as an international advisor and the designated sexual prevention representative at Lone Star College in North Harris. Refusing to be silenced by the darkness that isolated her, she advocates for peace and reconciliation while serving the disenfranchised and voiceless children of the world. Jean and her husband founded the charity One Million Orphans. Can we please give our next speaker, Jean Celestine Lakin, a round of applause? Thank you so much. You are so phenomenal. I read your book, and their message of hope just resonates throughout the entire book. You have been through so much. Can we start at the beginning? and give our audience a flavor of some of the trials that you've had to overcome, particularly as a child. Thank you so much again for having me. So I, when people ask me what I do and who I am, um, like all women in a room here, we just wear multiple hats and that's just who we are. I am um, a human rights advocate, um, I'm a mom and I'm also an author, as uh, beautiful Jackie has uh, shared with you. Um, but I wasn't, you know, at the stage where I am right now as a human rights advocate, uh, I want to take you back to Rwandan genocide against Tutsis in 1994. I was a nine-year-old uh, when the genocide took place. And uh, we were basically, grew up in a family where my parents had all the resources that we needed as children. And um, in a matter of three months, Rwandan genocide claimed over one million people. And so we went from having everything a child could have dreamed of to living in the bushes, hiding with, with me. I had three-year-old twin sisters in the bushes for two months and a half. And uh, at the end of the genocide, I had lost both my parents. Uh, I witnessed the death of my father being killed with machetes and clubs in Rwanda seen my mother as well, her uh, dead body, and my three-week-old uh, three uh, little brother. And so after I survived that genocide, I basically felt this, um, I mean, we talk about PTSD and trauma. It was so severe that I literally felt like I was descending into this darkness in Rwanda as an orphan uh, in the streets. And so I came to United States, um, luckily came to United States, learned English as my fifth language, and um, was able to get my uh, bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and then um, published a book and working in education and continue to advocate again for uh, women's rights. So it's been a journey, uh, Jackie, and thank you so much again for uh, that question. That's briefly what I do, uh, and as you can see in the background there, um, me and President Bush, I've done a, quite a lot of things that I feel like um, 
if I did not forgive the pain that I experienced, I wouldn't be, I would not have been able to do the things I do today. Before we get to President Bush, because we will, mm -hmm. uh, let's go back to your childhood. When your parents, your family were killed, you were now the caretaker to your twin sisters at the age of nine. You saw mothers put their phone numbers on their children's backs because you knew that was the only way they would be able to identify who these children are. How did you have the resilience and the strength at the age of nine to be a caretaker to your siblings and to go through all of the things before you even migrated to the United States? It's a very good question. So in the, in the middle of the genocide, I basically, once I, I was seeing the chaos that was happening all around us, uh, men, women, and children dying, I just felt like I needed to get out of the mindset of a nine-year-old to taking care of my uh, three-year-old uh, sister, twin sisters. And it was one of those switch that I had to make because I had no choice. Uh, I remember when my father walked into the house that before uh, the genocide and basically assigned me the twins. He said, you taking this group, you taking those twins, but in the middle of the genocide, I was like, oh my goodness, many of you who have children, especially you know, two-year-olds, we, we say terrible twos. I used to say in the genocide, terrible threes, because there was no way of having them understand what was happening in the, in the middle of the genocide, but I really, uh, because of my faith, I began praying and asking God to give me the strength to be able to not only survive the madness, but also to make it at the end, to have hope, to have a purpose at the end of that genocide. That's, that's lovely, and just as lovely as you are. And speaking of lovely, President Bush compared you to our First Lady, Michelle Obama. And I can tell you, you're beautiful, you're smart, articulate. I can understand the comparison. Tell us a little bit about your interaction with the president, and also, you are now an ambassador in so many fronts. So tell us about that role as well. The journey meeting uh, President Bush was an interesting one. So my husband and I, he's outside there, he's selling the books, so go see him. We were at the college where I worked I, as academic advisor. I was sitting in my office just advising away my you know, students. And then he walked into the room and he said, did you see that email the chief of staff sent us? I said, the one I'm about to put in uh, spam? He said, no, that's actually a real ad that's, that's President Bush wanting to reach out to you. He basically said he wanted to have has read the book and he wanted to have dinner with me and my husband and his beautiful wife. And um, I was like, oh my goodness, like again, many of us, we go, why me? But we are just daughters and sons of God. And so I say, okay, President Bush wants to have dinner with me, no big deal. <laughs> so they actually flew here in Houston area, him and his wife. And when I entered the room, my husband and I, they just made us feel so you know, comfortable, so welcomed. They're just wonderful human beings, uh, despite whatever, you know, political views of anyone else. They're just kind human beings. And so he said, well, I want to paint your portrait. I didn't even know that he painted people. So I said, sure. Last time I was painted, it was my son, who was, this, you know, a six-year-old with a stick figure. But now I'm going to be, you know, painted, uh, my portrait painted by the former president of the United States. I was like, great. And so the portrait is actually outside too, if you want to check it out. He, I think he did an incredible job. So um, up to this day, we go back and forth to Dallas. Uh, if there's events, uh, like you see that one when he was interviewing me uh, in Dallas, just so that we can continue to point out, you know, uh, and support uh, vulnerable children, vulnerable women. Uh, I'm actually uh, appointed person by the U through the UN as um, part of the human trafficking, just to end that crisis. I was speaking at the conference, in, you know, um, just last month, a couple months ago, in you at the UN conference, and um, I told the group, I said, what are the odds of me 
you know, sitting in a room with a, you know, from a president of the United States, coming from a country where it was flipped upside down, to even being an orphan and sitting in that room. But one of the things I kept going back to was what my father uh, told me before the genocide. He said, if you want to be invited at the table, if you want to change policies, if you want to be part of the policy make making, you have to be educated. And so there's so many people who have powerful stories, who cannot tell their stories because of lack of education. And that's one of the things that I've been able to do for uh, women and orphans, to really empower them to be able to tell their stories. Because as you share your stories, you just never know who you're going to empower. To see their, you know, I'm a genocide survivor, and if you read the book, you hear just the details and themes, but the book is used in the you know, high schools, universities, and it's incredible when you see you know, young women or boys really coming up to me, sharing their stories, because I was able to, uh, and my friend Julie who said, uh, uh, Brene Brown, we have so much, yeah, to be vulnerable enough, you empower somebody else, and that's what I've been able to do. I cannot tell you enough that you really need to read her book. It's not just about her incredible journey, but it's filled with messages of hope and how your faith, whatever your faith is, can get you through so much. Before we turn it over to the audience, because I know they're going to have a couple of questions, can you tell me, when you were preparing and writing this book, how did you, how easy was it to translate your life story into a story of forgiveness, hope, and keeping your strong faith? Because that's exactly how it resonates. Thank you so much, Jackie. Really, writing the story, a lot of people ask, was it, you know, uh, Catholic? And it was, and it was painful at the same time. But also, like, if I can take you back to being a child who witnessed the genocide and also being able to come out of it and feeling like I was descending into this darkness. And um, because of my faith, again, I started asking God, I don't think you saved me. I almost died more than 200 times in the genocide. And this is with men with machetes and clubs. And so I said, God, I don't think you saved me so that I can leave this darkness in my mind. And God has a way of really speaking to us, whether it's through the, you know, the Bible, however you believe, or just like it's through the Holy Spirit. And God told me, said, forgive them. So gently, forgive them. And I can tell you, I said back, I said, I don't think I have what it takes to be able to forgive being raped as a child, being able to, you know, seeing my father being killed in the genocide, especially because my father was, you know, my hero. And so when he said, forgive them, I said, I don't have the strength, but if you want me to be able to do these things, empower me to be able to do that. And when he did that, Jackie, it was, I usually tell the audience that I felt like I was almost flying up in the sky because I felt just relieved. And when we forgive, when we have the ability to be able to forgive the pain that others have caused us, it's not for them, it's for us. Forgiveness liberates our souls. And so once I was able to forgive, I really felt like the, every potential was open for me. Like all these doors that were closed, somehow they were just were open because I, I felt like I was able to fulfill or tap into God's purpose for my life, whether it's to encourage somebody else, whether it's to give hope, whether it's to really use our pain for purpose. I say, God, you, you, you got me. And again, a lot of times I walk into places and I go, okay, God, who the heck do you think I am? I'm a daughter of the high, most high king, God, so. What an inspiration you are to so many. And thank you so much for sharing your beautiful and wonderful story. And we will continue to watch and see you flourish and to bring so many other inspirational messages to all of us. At this time, I'm going to see if we have any questions from the audience. So 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm an immigrant as well. I'm from Vietnam. A bit of me has a guilt that I'm here and living a good life, where, you know, the place where I came from, people are still somewhat suffering. Do you have that, and how do you deal with it? Thank you for the question. Uh, the question was if I have, there's that guilt because you know you, you watch other people from where you come from uh, still are suffering. And honestly, I don't have the guilt. Um, I just believe that every little impact that I can make, whether it's uh, again in women, you know, vulnerable women advocating for them, uh, whether it's uh, in advocating for children, every little impact that I'm able to make towards making a change for somebody else, maybe that's why I'm here. So I really don't feel guilty. I get involved in so many things. Um, I was just in uh, um, Vienna last year where we were talking about Ukraine, um, just the war in Ukraine. And I was in a room of people with a lot of powers and sharing my story and also asking them to have empathy as they approach the people of Ukraine. When, like Jackie you know, uh, confirmed, when you're seeing parents writing phone numbers on the backs of their children because they don't know when they're going to meet their children, it, what can you do? Every single one of us in this room has the power and the ability to make a change, to make an impact in other people's lives. We have the power to advocate, to educate, to make an awareness. Whatever issue that you're compassionate about, you can make an impact. And so, you, you, therefore, you don't feel guilty because you feel like, check, I've done these things for somebody else. Thank you. And if I can add to that as an immigrant myself, the people from our respective countries they see us shine, and when they see us shine, they're shining with us, and we're lifting them all up. Absolutely. And so you ladies, I'm included as well, those of us who are first or second generation immigrants, we are the vision and what our people are hopeful of. So that's a great question. Do we have any more? We do. Here I am. I'm so curious. I'm in the middle here. I see you looking for me. <laughs> I'm curious, you know, we hear these stories and they are so gut-wrenching, and I hear as a believer that you have an extreme amount of faith and belief for the future, but can you give us at least a lasting example of what's happening now that's putting a dent in some of the issues that you're championing? Can we hear some good news about what's going on in terms of um, sex trafficking, orphans? Give us some good news just to know that the stats we hear are not the only part of the story. It'd be wonderful to hear. Absolutely, thank you for that question uh, as well. So with, uh, we have like one million orphans, and if you purchase the book, you're actually, we give the proceeds towards those children. And, um, and that's one area we're making an impact. Um, you know, in, internationally, there was a, a slowdown in getting children adopted overseas, whether it's the United States adopting you know, kids from different countries. But we decided that we meet those children where they are, uh, in the orphanage homes, supporting orphanages that supports those orphans. In terms of uh, uh, advocating for human trafficking, um, just being in the UN uh, setting, whether I am teaching trauma-informed, one of the things I've done uh, when I'm in the UN setting is to advocate for not only to end human trafficking in general, but also to provide support for the survivors. I, myself, as a survivor, what is it that we can do? Uh, one of the things that we ha I advocate a lot of times is to advocate for mental health, really to have counselors, professional counseling for these individuals who have gone through you know, human trafficking because it's, it's a severe. And my last point I wanna make is that when you empower a woman, you're basically impacting not only a community, you're impacting a country, you're impacting society. Women are just the, the source of economy in a country. So you ladies, you have a lot of powers in your hands if you, you do not know. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you again next Thursday at 6 p.m. For more information about the Chamber and our podcast, please visit us at ghwcc.org.